I'm Brad Power, and I'm the uh, host of Cancer Hacker Lab. I'm joined today by uh, obviously a number of you, but primarily Brian McCluskey and Rick Stanton, who are our leaders and advanced cancer patients, uh, advanced prostate cancer patients. Uh, today's objective is mostly just to share uh, what we are up to. This has been uh, in process, getting this, this uh, prostate cancer lag, lab off the ground has been in process for all, over a year since uh, we had a hackathon for Bryce Olson a year ago. And uh, this is the, the culmination of a lot of planning and preparation. Dr. Anthony Joseph and Dr. Oh. Andreas Gonzalez. Access patient forms and information. Thank you. And for I'm going to mute you. That's Rick, I think. Oh, there you go. Thanks, thanks, Rick. Um, so um, uh, we'll kick it off by doing some introductions of of uh, Brian and Rick, uh, and then what we're intending to do with this uh, cancer hacker pro prostate cancer lab uh, over the coming coming uh, coming months. Um, Brian, why don't you start? And, and, and then Rick with introducing yourselves and then we'll go into your medical history and then we'll go into like your intentions and, and goals for this, uh, this group. Great, so thanks so much, Brad. So uh, I'm Brian McCloskey. I'm a 56 year old uh, father of three, husband. I was diagnosed uh, five and a half years ago um, and I've uh, been on an interesting journey ever since. Um, professionally, I spent the better part of 25 years building personalized consumer experiences uh, in e-commerce and uh, basically in high tech, and then um, most recently managed uh, marketing for the largest healthcare staffing firm in the country, AMN Healthcare. Um, so really my background is very uh, data and digitally oriented, and when I was diagnosed with cancer, um, I realized that there were definitely some opportunities in terms of how we use data to better personalize the experience. And I certainly have used my background as a, um, as a view. Sorry, was there an echo? No, it is. Yeah, if everyone could mute who's not uh, speaking, uh, that we're, we're good. Go, go, go ahead, Brian. Okay. Um, so anyway, so, so that my background professionally has played um, a big part in my role in terms of how I've approached my cancer. Uh, and really, the essence of that is trying to understand my cancer, um, because I think before you can really treat a patient well, you first need to understand what the disease is, is all about. And that draws completely from how I used many different types of data to personalize consumer experiences. And to date, I haven't seen anything that would tell me that that analogy doesn't hold true in medicine. There's a ways to go in medicine. And that's really what this is about. It's about how do we get smarter uh, about our diseases and how do we use that information to more intelligently uh, treat us? Um, so that's it uh, professionally. And personally, uh, you know, uh, my passion and my hobby is surfing. So I live in San Diego, California. Uh, I have um, been a surfer for the better part of 35 years. Um, the ocean is part of my life. Uh, and I've somehow managed to pass it on to my kids. And uh, we definitely uh, spend a lot of time in the water and we're blessed to have San Diego as our, as our playground. Thanks, Brian. Rick. Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Rick Stanton. Um, while surfing is on a theme, uh, I'm a surfer as well. Uh, not as a big time guy as Brian, he's uh, mucho. Uh, I'm like a late beginner. I got two kids, a wonderful wife. Uh, I started teaching my daughter surfing when she was three years old and uh, she ended up uh, moving to Hawaii to surf, you know, after getting a biology degree. Um, about me, uh, I'm stage four. I'm on chemo. I've um, gone through multiple rounds. <clears throat> uh, my uh, prostate cancer was discovered on a jump in PSA and just uh, my yearly checkup. It was like, I had no symptoms. Um, it's like, what? And, uh, 
It turns out uh, I have a CDK12 mutation, which is aggressive, uh, but it opens some uh, therapy uh, options as well. So my goal is to, uh, a bit like Brian's, and I'll just say it in a different way, um, there's, I think, a thousand clinical trials going on uh, for pro advanced prostate cancer. And they're targeting about, I don't know, I'll, I'll say roughly 25, 30 uh, molecular targets of immune and uh, some inside uh, the tumor cell, which would be called targeted. And I and Brian are at or nearing the end, depending on how you uh, consider standard of care for NCCN guidelines, meaning you first have prostate cancer, uh, oh, it's not contained. Uh, oh, we're going to put you on an androgen blocking uh, hormone. And that would be like the first line and you go through until you, you hit chemo. And now uh, I'm on my fifth round of chemo. And so it's, well, what do I do as this fails? Meaning you can't stay on chemo forever. It's maybe not working forever. I'm starting to have some... Uh, tingling in my fingers. I'm a guitarist. And so that's a bad thing. Um, so my hope is to help Brian, myself and patients to come on what is the best next therapy after standard of care as we push into immunotherapies uh, and uh, combination conventional targeted and immunotherapies. I have just talked, I have three doctors, uh, four doctors, depending, uh, you know, so I'm getting uh, multiple uh, counsel and there are like different doctors will have different clinical trials as an option. I'm finding that none of these are particularly informed by my, my state. So RNA-seq is typically not used uh, mutations are, so my CDK12 mutation will, is being used to guide my therapy, but that's it. Uh, other than tumor molecular burden and some basics. Um, but I'm hoping to get guidance on which clinical trial or which therapy to try next with the hope that we could either manage this disease quite well uh, or maybe even a cure. Uh, so Great. making that, making that decision is of which of these many trials, why, why would it be good for me or a different one for Brian? That's my goal. Great. So um, if we could, is there anything more that Brian or Rick that you would like to say about your medical history? Uh, but that's, that's, you've just given us sort of the overview introduction anything to just set the stage. I know whenever we involve clinicians, that's one of their first questions is, you know, what's your, what are the detail, more detail on your treatment history and, and uh, your, how your PSA, <clears throat> how your PSA has gone up and down and all that. Sure. Ricky, you want to go and then I'll, I'll chime sure, in. Sure. Sure. Uh, I've, uh, my treatments, uh, I was diagnosed in late 2019. Uh, my treatments have been salvage radiation, uh, Lupron, uh, and Casadex, which controlled um, my uh, PSA uh, for 13 months. So that was great. Uh, I then went on darlutamide, uh, which is a next generation uh, antigen receptor blocker. And that didn't really do so much. And that was a very promising drug for many people. Uh, I was on that for four months and my PSA uh, started rising uh, to 3.6. Uh, my doubling time was um, about a month. So it was not being controlled by darlutamide at all, pretty much after the first month or two. Um, I was determined that I should go on uh, docetaxel chemo, <clears throat> which I've been on since December. Uh, it brought me from 3.6 to 2.6, so only a marginal drop in my PSA. Um, I have, I'm at a nodal disease, so I've got five or six lymph nodes uh, that uh, 
have tumor cancer in them from my neck to my pelvis, uh, as shown in a combination of uh, CT and PSMA scans. Uh, so I'm currently at a PSA of 2.6. Uh, my largest lymph node is uh, about a, a centimeter. Uh, it's in the middle of my chest. Um, and uh, I'm requested IHC stains from my primary tumor, <clears throat> which might guide my uh, um, tills or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that might predict uh, a bit of responsiveness to immunotherapy. So I hope that. And just so you heard all that, it, it's implicit in what uh, Rick is saying that he is a bioinformatician by background, <laughs> as he oh. as he rattled that all off. So you, you see, is he's bald? That's from the chemo, and then you got the, that's also obvious. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the picture on the website was just it was in December, so that was you know four months ago, right before the uh, I lost my hair. Uh, and Brian. Sure, I'm going to share uh, just a quick graphic, and hopefully that will uh, make this a little bit easier. First off, I want to just thank everybody for joining. I really appreciate your time. I didn't say that at the beginning, and I uh, apologize for that, but uh, I really do appreciate everybody taking time out of their day uh, to join us on this, this journey. Um, that means a lot to, to me, for sure. Okay, so um, I'm not going to get into all of the depth of this. Um, can everybody see what I'm sharing? Yep. Yeah, good. So uh, I, I was diagnosed in 2016, had a radical prostatectomy. Um, you can see in the light blue, my, uh, my DNA mutations, TP53, PBRM1, Um, You know, I went on a, a number of different treatments from hormone therapy, radiation, uh, went on a second line hormone therapy with apalutamide. You, know, you can see um, decision number four. Um, then I went on a holiday, and as soon as I went on a holiday, my disease came roaring back. Uh, my Gleason is a 4-3 with a tertiary grade 5, which would largely explain the aggressiveness of the disease. Um, I ended up having six metastatic lesions in my peritoneum. Um, that was discovered in uh, July of 2020. Uh, I actually had robotic surgery in uh, August of 2020. Uh, from that, we determined that my DNA mutations were uh, the same from my original uh, primary tumor uh, from 2016. Uh, Rick did an amazing job of quarterbacking an RNA seq analysis with uh, Tempest, our friends at Tempest. And uh, there were a lot of findings from that, but um, of note, there were a few uh, expressions that were, I think, relevant, CD276, CD357, TDO2, and PSMA. Uh, my TILs are 0%, uh, which I think, I know Rick- a pre Preliminarily. Preliminarily. Uh, Rick, I think yours is a little bit better than mine, but certainly, you know, not, 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 not great, right? Um, so, you know, um, uh, definitely some challenges uh, in, term of, in terms of a uh, in, um, highly immunosuppressive uh, environment. Um, after my surgery, I uh, started, uh, we knew we didn't get it all, right? So I started a, a systemic therapy. Uh, we, we gave it a shot with chemo and pembrolizumab, uh, Keytruda. I started that in October of 2020 six rounds of chemo. And then I remained on Pembro for until uh, uh, October of 2021. And then uh, began to see my PSA uh, rise and uh, lesions reappeared. I was actually no evidence of disease um, after my surgery, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm sorry, sh shortly after that. Uh, in any event, I started uh, Abiraterone uh, in November of 2021, and it's kind of cut off here, but I started, my PSA was at 0.91, and it's dropped to a 0.45. So I am currently responsive to Abby, which is great, um, but I also, and I don't know how much mileage I'm going to get on this, uh, but 
I know that the likelihood of becoming a uh, hormone uh, insensitive is high. And so really, you know, my objective is to, uh, my objective is, is to determine what is going to be the next best therapy for me. And this is just a quick snapshot over five and a half years. You know, this is sort of like what my cancer journey has looked like in terms of just the sheer number of visits that I've had to, to go through. So, you know, office visits, you know, the dominant one, labs are huge. Radiation was a big part of my journey early on, uh, imaging, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, my, well, I'm gonna go back here for just a second. So as I kind of think about the future, um, I think about sort of all of the different treatments that are kind of like on the table. I mean, I'm still hormone sensitive. Um, we'll see how that goes, right? Um, this is, this is sort of what that table looks like. And really what I wanna do is I wanna get much smarter about which treatments can I rule out and which ones are the ones that are gonna be most relevant for me. And today, the way that the decisions that I've experienced are largely made are based upon uh, the stage of disease, metastatic, hormone sensitive, non-hormone sensitive, and then, and then as well as past treatments, uh, medical history, et cetera. And then trying to relate that profile of me, essentially the like clinical trials um, and what I would call almost like sort of like semi mass treatment uh, uh, response rates. And um, I just believe that we could do better than that. Uh, so, you know, on my journey, we've, we looked at my DNA. We found some interesting findings from that. Uh, I think we found some interesting uh, findings from the RNA seq analysis. And I just wonder what else we can really find if we continue to uh, to look at my profile from a genomic perspective, from a cell perspective, an extracellular perspective. Look at my immune system, maybe a few other factors uh, that can help me do a better job of, again, ruling out treatments as well as prioritizing those that are gonna provide me with the greatest response. And so, you know, my, my mission is to live as long as I possibly can. And, you know, this graphic is, you know, one way to kind of depict that. The blue line represents me trotting along and surfing, you know, and enjoying my life with my family. And then, you know, back in 2016, this red line began to appear and um, it quickly became apparent that, uh, that this could certainly shorten my life. And, you know, I want to be around for when, you know, my daughter, you know, gets married and be a grandfather. I'm 56. Um, and so my mission is to get back to that blue line. I wanna get back to living my best life. And um, I'm so thankful for the amazing care that I have. Um, and there've been amazing advancements. However, I also see that there's an opportunity for us to increase the pace of translational medicine. And um, I'm so thankful to have Rick and Brad on this journey, because I believe that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to better use the insights that exist in the lab and bring them to the table to be able to, uh, to treat our diseases uh, more effectively than what we are now. And I have conversations every day uh, with so many amazing scientists and researchers, et cetera, and doctors um, about how those improvements are happening. And uh, I just want us to take a little bit of a different approach. And I think that this prostate cancer lab <clears throat> represents an opportunity for do that. I am more and more convinced every day that this is a real opportunity. And I hope you'll find that as well. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of support along the way and, uh, and our full commitment. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you. So um, this, uh, 
before we go on, I, uh, I'm going to tee up a discussion of the the prostate cancer lab that we're going to be launching here with uh, Rick and Brian as the lead patients. But before I do, any uh, in the spirit of discussion here, any questions? Uh, we've got some some clinicians on the call. I know Rick Davis is very smart about all this. So uh, any anyone with any questions or clarifying questions? I just wanted to compliment uh, Brian on this flow chart and everything, because I was envisioning such a thing earlier that this could really help in any diagnosis when you want to pass information from one doctor to the next. If you can get this kind of overview and you can click on links to various you know, lab tests and, and scans, it's a brilliant uh, for the future of medicine all across the board. You know, I think it's really uh, a really a great way to um, present your case as, you know. as someone who works across cancers it's it's uh it's really uh lucky in a way that prostate cancer does have the psa which is sort of a uh you know a measure of the the strength of the disease uh for ovarian cancer the fca 125 you know similarly so you mm -hmm. can run an experiment you know basically what you're doing is you're running an experiment on yourself all the time and then seeing what knocks things down and then it comes back and then you try something else you knock it down uh, so it's, it's it lends itself to that nice graphic representation yeah any, any other any other questions uh again on on more on the the setup that that you just heard from brian and rick stacy hi everyone um yeah that was so helpful um a uh, picture's worth a thousand words. In colon cancer, we have CEAs that I watch religiously with mine. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, but before we talk about options, just wanted to ask really quickly, do either of you, and, and apologize if I miss this, do either of you have any glaring comorbidities that would exclude you right off the bat from uh, big, you know, clinical trials or anything. Just wanted to ask that. Thank you. No, Stacy. I mean, if, uh, yeah, no. Um, unfortunately, I would say I'm I'm a pretty healthy guy. Uh, I exercise all the time. I think that's the one thing that I do that I can control, and um, and so I take that pretty seriously. I know Rick does too. Um, so. Yeah, you know, you'd look at me and you may not even think I have cancer. I, I get that all the time. Um, right, yeah, you maybe, I don't know, it's a strong mind, whatever. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, no comorbidities at all. Uh, same with me, um, trying to work out a lot, no core comorbidities. Uh, currently swimming a mile most days, lifting weights, fighting it. Okay. Anyone else? Any uh, any other questions on the medical history? Yeah, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, um, do we have any genitourinary medical oncologists on on the panel? I don't recognize any names. No, not 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 in. I tend to say Jason Sager is a uh, is a um, MD oncologist, but uh, not specializing in prostate necessarily. Okay, so I, I'll he, make the by training. I, okay. I do want to mention that my primary care medical oncologist is Dr. Sandy Liu out of UCLA. And even though she couldn't make it, uh, she is very supportive and will be, uh, you know, checking out our progress uh, asynchronously as she can. Uh, actually, also Tanya Dorf at uh, City of Hope. Um, and John Shen at UCLA and Raina McKay at UC San Diego. So those are my uh, medical oncologists from three institutions. Um, I think they're awesome and they uh, guide clinical trials in prostate cancer. So they're very knowledge knowledgeable about options. So even though they're not on the call, they're very supportive. Um, just yeah, we have a we have uh, so, we've identified about six or eight uh, clinicians who have committed to participate with us, but asynchronously and not on these calls every week. Right. So my question to both Rick and to Brian um, is, uh, I don't know who you go to first, whether it's Dr. Lou, whether it's Dr. Dorf, sounds like Dr. Lou, but um, what are they each saying about 
where you are in terms of your treatment and what are they recommending you you do right now? Great okay. question. Rick, you want to take them, then I'll chime in. Yeah, I, I can, I'll take about a minute or two on that with a share screen uh, if I can. I'll see if I can. Um, oh, I got to open system preferences on my note, new computer. I'll just describe it then. Um, Dr. Liu is my primary uh, medical oncologist because oh. I'm on a ARCUS-6 clinical trial, uh, which uh, unfortunately I was assigned to the docetaxel or the chemo arm only. The clinical trial is um, run out of ARCUS Biosciences, who I know the CEO, I used to work for him uh, and report up through him at it while I did 17 years at Amgen in discovery research. So I know, um, the Arcus team very well. I used to consult for them. Uh, so I saw the adenosine PD-1 and uh, docetaxel um, clinical trial is something that I wanted to explore. Uh, unfortunately, I was assigned to, uh, it was a randomized trial, but it was uh, not blind. So I, I know I got assigned to the docetaxel arm only. So that uh, is, you know, reaching its end. And I talked with Dr. Dorf uh, and I'm trying to be proactive for any prost any cancer patient. You know, you, you try not to wait until, oh man, my current therapy is no longer working. What do I do? Oh, there's a wait. Oh, you know, you can't see the right person. Oh, you got to do the fill out the form. So, you know, it's got to be approved by insurance. And in the meantime, you failed this the therapy you're on and time is you're, you're basically giving cancer a head start. So I'm just prior to it, my next decision. And so I uh, contacted uh, Dr. Dorf uh, as a second opinion, went over my history. Um, and she recommended uh, a Zencore trial, which is uh, bispecific PD-1 and CTLA-4. Uh, along with Olaparib. So that was her recommendation. Uh, I'm also trying to get IHC stains for CD3, CD4, CD8, and PD1, uh, PDL1, sorry. Um, so I'm waiting for that result. And then uh, I talked can, to Can I ask you, do you have any, do you have any markers for, um, for a PD1, um, for a Laparib? Is there any indicator that any of those drugs might be suitable for you? Uh, population statistics at this point. So, right. so I mean, the, the no reason no the reason I ask this is because we we've run across recently, and and it really bothers me. Um, we've run across reputable GU medonks who are eager to put people into trials when they have no indicators it's going to be successful now we have plenty of indicators that um, if you don't have a high to uh, tumor burden if you don't have uh, if you're not msi high if you don't have a uh, bracker or possibly atm um, that a lot of these drugs don't seem to be appropriate um, you're in a situation where the chemo, albeit it has side effects, but we, but there are ways to work on those side effects, including the neuropathy, is holding your disease. Um, I mean, we've just had a guy who's who's moving into a, a lutetium managed access trial uh, in the next three weeks, who's just finished over thirty sessions of chemo over a period of three years, and uh, until about two months ago, it kept his. PSA in check. And, and whilst I am all for looking at new trials and new therapies, I get very concerned that guys that come to us for guidance are not used as lab rats. And, um, and, and I just, I want to put that out there and say, yeah, I mean, you're getting a little bit of neuropathy, but that's not unusual after five sessions. I mean, what about reducing the dose 
sticking with where you are, maybe looking at, uh, I don't know the last time you did just an, a regular NGS, but maybe looking at what shows up right now, considering a, adding a, maybe a platinum based if something unusual shows up. And in the meantime, the science is moving so quickly, which is why we're all here. You know, a year from now, if this holds you, there could be a clear, something clear. Um, but to throw you into a, to throw you into an anti-PD-1 CTLA trial, which is going to be really hard on your body and add a lap or rib, I mean, you know, it's going to do horrendous things to your blood counts, potentially, um, when you, you know, you, you, you know what you got right now with, 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 with docetaxel and you can adjust the dose and it's keeping you in check. I, I have to ask, do we really want to be doing that this exercise right now? I, I wanted to mention that both, um, well, all my doctors uh, recommend that I stay on docetaxel for as long as possible. So they're, they are in complete agreement with you and they are conservative and they're not like, hey, let's go shooting off on some clinical unproven trial. So they are, in fact, they're very um, conservative and uh, I appreciate that. And by the way, I think you're uh, amazing, Rick. Um, and I've, I've attended a number of ANCAN uh, um, webinars or conversations, you know, the weekly meetings. Uh, I only did a few, but I see what you're doing to patients and I appreciate it. Uh, many are, le you know, less informed. Uh, and in fact, uh, when, when a cancer patient starts this journey, it's like, you know, you have no idea what you're getting into, you know, and uh, thank you, Rick. It's, I, I was it's gonna, my pleasure. And, uh, I was going to make that introduction uh, for those who don't know. No. Rick is the, the leader of ANCAN, which is a, a, a consortium of, of, of advanced can prostate cancer patients and other cancers. So you can tell how knowledgeable he is. And he was very helpful to us in our previous Hackathon with Bryce Olson. Brian, did you want to say anything? I'll make it real brief. Um, Rick, you were actually part of uh, uh, my last decision, right? So you might recall uh, when my PSA began to go up, we looked at abiraterone, enzalutamide, we looked at apalutamide, where I had an amazing response, and darolutamide. And I think you had recommended that I, I, I try darolutamide. You know, so I'm being treated at UCSD, uh, Raina McKay. She's my primary aunt. She's incredible, right? She is absolutely amazing. And I'm just so fortunate to have her. I, I have many other medical oncologists um, that I speak to on a regular basis. Um, she's, she's great. In any event, you know, really, we decided that we were going to go down the abiraterone route. And I think the primary driver for that was that there were some clinical trials um, where there was a, a lot of great success with it. And part of it was based upon, you know, Abby uh, plus chemo. I had just come out of chemo, so it probably wasn't like the greatest fit. Again, you know, this is where it's part art, part science, and it's maybe more art than it is science in terms of the decision that we actually made. And, you know, where I want to maybe focus this effort is not, not necessarily jumping to treatment decisions. I am fortunate in that I am responding to abiraterone right now. Um, that list that I showed a while ago, honestly, Rick, all of those have been part of my discussions with Raina and with several other doctors. Um, I just spent some time with Tanya Dorf uh, yesterday and we talked about, uh, you know, when would it make sense to, to do a CAR T? I had an amazing conversation with Saul Priceman on my way home from City of Hope. And um, we talked about some really great opportunities to do some, I think, um, cutting edge diagnostics. And right now, where I am in sort of like this maybe honeymoon period, I don't know how long it's going to last. I want to get a better handle on my disease. I want the data to speak. I've seen it in my professional career. 
so many times. It's like the cardinal sin of marketing. If you think you know who your customer is, you're wrong. Um, you need to let them speak and you need to let the data speak. And so, um, you know, uh, you know, even though the work that, that Rick did on my RNA seq analysis, um, it wasn't immediately um, sort of processed um, by you know my oncology team. Um, and then after three months, um, you know, I got to thank you for it. You know, that that this, this is information that we could actually use for targeting, uh, namely B seven H three CD two seventy six. And so, you know, I have pretty good handle on what my DNA looks like, you know, decent idea of what's going on from an RNA perspective. Um, that's opened up new doors. And as we just kind of look at the flow of diagnostics, potentially get into proteomics and other things, what else am I going to uncover within those specific fields and then when you start to look at them in aggregate and across each other from a, a genomic perspective, a cell perspective, an extracellular perspective, immune, et cetera, how is that all going to kind of come together and provide new context for how my prostate cancer, Rick's prostate cancer uh, has evolved and how hopefully we can um, identify more meaningful treatment options. That's where this is. And I can just tell you that I've spoken to many, many people from researchers, oncologists, et cetera. Um, I'm very, very fortunate. Like Laura Kleiman, who's on this call. Thank you, Laura, for being here. <laughs> you know, I reach out to people and they pick up the phone. It's just, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy. Um, but I'm more and more convinced that what we're trying to do here is novel. Um, there, there's something kind of similar, it's called Promise, where uh, there's a team of, of medical oncologists and researchers that are trying to correlate um, DNA genomics, and really it's, it's DNA to treatments. Um, but I think that that has, it's, it's dealing with a limited set of information, which is basically DNA. And there's how much of that is actually even out there for prostate cancer patients? There certainly is some, right? Um, and I just think that, yes, continue on that effort, but I think that we really need to look more holistically at all of the different diagnostic tools uh, that can really shed light on, on our cancers. So let me just underscore that, that um, Rick has been particularly useful in providing introductions into this new diagnostic area called spatial analysis, which is looking at the tumor microenvironment. Uh, we've had conversations with Akoya Biosciences, Nanostring, Enable Medicine, and these are all uh, research use only at this time. Uh, these are tests that are being used to come up with an understanding of the heterogeneity of the of the of the cancer and of the microenvironment. And they're just amazing tests. And we want to accelerate its use for clinical guidance for, for us, uh, for Rick, for Brian, and for other patients that would follow. And that will be a key part of this, uh, this uh, prostate cancer lab that we're launching to see which of those tests are useful uh, in, a, in, a, in clinical guidance. Um, and it's uh, part of our challenge is overcoming the hurdles of, of tests, which are currently for research use only and being able to use them for clinical guidance. And again, Rick has been negotiating with these companies to get access. Uh, Rick, do you want to say, any, say anything on that? Yes, uh, I, but I'd like to um, introduce Nick Shork along those lines because there's another uh, wonderful organization called TGen, um, Danielle, Sarah, Brian, uh, Byron, and Nick Shork are on the uh, call today. Uh, they've been supporting me in a most unusual way uh, due to basically my, my friendship with Nick. Uh, that never would have happened. So 
Nick, if you don't mind saying hello and mentioning a little bit about TGen and sure. Happy to. So Brad, good to reconnect others on the phone. You know, this is very inspirational. Um, as uh, Brad pointed out, and as I think everyone on the call knows, one limitation for putting data, say, at the uh, on the desk of a physician to use is if, in fact, it only has research use only designation, there are liability issues for what a physician can do. That That is a constraint we're, we're all operating under. However, uh, as Rick's pointing out, and as Brad, I think you know, we put a protocol together that was approved by an ethical body to provide research use only and other data types back to Rick so he could do with that data as he pleases, including putting it uh, in front of a hackathon group like this. Uh, and something remarkable happened the other day, and this just shows uh, Rick's uh, strength. Uh, there were concerns about our protocol, what parameters we needed to operate under that the ethical body was considering. So what I suggested is that Rick actually speak to the Western IRB people. And he did that, uh, was able to field their questions. Uh, they told us uh, we could provide data. We didn't have reach through. And so we couldn't police uh, what was done with that data after it left, say, TGEN's offices and showed up on, on Rick's door. And what we learned, which was remarkable, and Western IRB is a huge organization. They see many different protocols. Rick was the first patient to ever appear before <laughs> this ethical body and just basically give his two mm -hmm. cents worth. So I see this as enormous progress. That doesn't mean we have carte blanche to do whatever we want but it is an opening in a recognition that if in fact data is collected on a patient, then the patient should have the right to use that data in whatever form he sees fit. One analogy we made is there's legislation about right to try particular drugs. So if you're off guidelines, you have a debilitating disease, there's legislation that would allow patients access to drugs that otherwise might not be available to them. So I said, if in fact there's legislation about people's uh, uh, ability to try drugs that might be complicated, why isn't there legislation to allow people to use data, which is you know, even less uh, complicated to use? So I think some substantial progress has been made through the strength of people like Rick to, to just put themselves out there and appear before ethical bodies like Western IRB. So Brad, we are happy to kind of trade notes in the future about how we were able to put this protocol together. Uh, uh, we'll share the template, uh, Sarah and Danielle are on the phone, happy to do that. So if it could be recreated at other institutions, it does take a little bit of time, but it gives us kind of more freedom to operate. Let's put it that way. So, you know, happy to be here, very inspirational. Thank you, Nick. And, and Nick is a hero uh, for all of us in terms of, uh, a history of, of bridging the gap between uh, data and then clinical guidance for, for people. So it's, a, it's an honor to have you, you here. Um, and I think this Nick has really tapped into and in what, what Rick and Brian have been saying, I hope give you a sense of the potential of this group. It's only become clear to me in the last few weeks that this patient led uh, initiative, just as Nick was saying, it kind of cuts through all of the regulatory uh, typical protections that are, are well-meaning and in place, but it means that therapies go through processes that, uh, you know, these, these, these diagnostic tests will eventually get into clinical use, but it might be five, eight years in the future. And we have patients in front of us right now who need to make a choice between, the, as, as Brian so eloquently laid out, between a number of choices, and these tests might help guide which is the, gonna be the most likely to provide benefit. And so in the, exactly as Nick said, the, the patient and the patient need in, the, in, in an advanced cancer patient who is facing life and death doesn't have time to wait for the regulatory niceties. And so that is what we're on top of. And I think what's happening is that if you look at the stakeholders around this decision, the, the diagnostic companies obviously wanna get their research use only technology into clinical use as fast as possible. So they want that accelerated. The clinicians, the, the doctors, uh, Brian and Rick's doctors are quite happy to have 
information that will help them in their decisions. As Brian already pointed out when he brought RNA-seq data in and it helped identify some new treatments. So they're on board. And so we're actually kind of catalyzing and cutting through um, an environment that, that most of the parties involved would actually like to see uh, and, and it, you know, done to help these patients in their decisions. So maybe if on, I could just so. add a little bit of color to that too, yeah. Brad. Um, so many of the conversations that a patient has in the clinic is about treatments. What are the treatment options? You know, I'm at, at the end of the line on this one. The conversation that I've never had until last week that I'm just beginning to, to get into is what are we doing with my tissue to help inform my treatment? We know that tissue is a scarce resource in the diagnostics landscape. Um, and how we use that tissue is for diagnostics is critical. We need to not only have a treatment strategy, but we need to have a diagnostic strategy, which is rooted in this scarce resource of tissue. Yes, there are liquid biopsies, et cetera, uh, potentially organoids. I'm on a lot of different, a lot of different paths right now. Um, and some amazing technology that's happening. Um, but the point is still that where I'm trying to go is I wanna shift some of the conversation focus on, again, understanding. And to understand, you've got to have diagnostics, and to have diagnostics, you got to figure out what we're going to do with uh, with tissue. So, can I just can I just um, add a quick um, little bit of color to that, Brian? Because we just had a situation that, that really bothered me. Had a guy at Jefferson with a doc that was pushing him into a, an unsuitable trial. At least we thought it was unsuitable. And um, they insisted on doing a biopsy. Um, the, this, this doc was um, resistant to sending a sample to FMI for, for NGS, but we, we kept pushing um, the patient to advocate for himself. And um, when he went in for the biopsy about four weeks ago, we said to him, make sure you tell him that you want enough tissue taken not just for the trial to be analyzed, but you want them to take tissue to send to, uh, to um, FMI. So he did. Um, now he'd already gotten a blood test. He'd already gotten a liquid biopsy, but as, as, as most of you um, are probably aware, uh, you don't get a good uh, MSI reading from, 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 from blood biopsies, and he really needed a solid tissue biopsy to see if he was MSI high or not. So they took it and he had to push him and push him. And eventually after about a week and a half, they did send off what they had and then he didn't hear anything. Why didn't he hear anything? Well, it turned out there wasn't sufficient tissue for FMI to, uh, to do an analysis. I mean, it, it's just outrageous. It's outrageous. So then he, he finished up switching docs. He went to another doc. I'm not going to name any names there. He went in for a bone biopsy, another bone biopsy last week, and now the tissues at FMI. But this is ridiculous. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. This is, uh, we've run now four hackathons, and the, the issue is tissue has been a recurring theme and tissue management and advocating and whenever you go outside of these institutions which are very comfortable working inside whenever you send it out the pathologists always have handoff issues uh it, it's it's been a recurring theme um i we're getting close to the end um i wanted to just um sh uh, give you an overview of uh what we're what we're calling the uh our poster and i i hope everyone can see this um this yes. is this is um, there we go. Um, this gives you a sense of the uh, cycle that we're trying to launch for Brian and Rick, and that we will be uh, we'll be talking uh, through this. You you see quite a number of companies on the gather data side, uh, consistent with what we've been talking about. 
regarding uh, trying to get as much data and information to inform decisions as we, as we possibly can. We're adding to this all, all the time. Um, you see uh, Ann can and uh, Brian can speak to Prostate Cancer F Foundation and this National Association of uh, Prostate Cancer Coalition group um, to help us get additional patients into this uh, cycle with us. Uh, you see TGen over there and helping analyze. Uh, we have friends at CureMatch, Omicure, Cancer Commons, Xcures, and then some of the doctors that have said that they will commit to help us do clinical uh, review of some of the treatment options that come out. Uh, so I just want to introduce this. Uh, Brian, would you speak to anything you want to on this, but in particular on the relationships with Prostate Cancer Foundation and uh, the others that, that we've been talking to? Sure. Um, so the National Alliance for State Prostate Cancer uh, Coalitions, I'm now on the board of that. I just um, spoke in January in D.C. about you know, my journey and the decision making process. Um, uh, they are a coalition of state prostate cancer groups um, and uh, just kind of getting to know them a little bit. But the, most notably, they produce Prostatepedia, which is a phenomenal resource. Uh, for prostate cancer patients, um, all articles written by experts in their field. Uh, so it's an amazing um, magazine. And then with the Prostate Cancer Foundation, um, I've worked with them on a number of different fronts. Um, was involved, Laura Kleiman, who was on here uh, recently, we were working with um, uh, Howard Sewell and others uh, on uh, AI-enabled uh, drug repurposing for prostate cancer. Um, more recently, I've gotten a little bit more involved with Gina Carithers, who is the um, uh, founder of Euro Today, um, and then she, spent, within the past two weeks, I spent about an hour and a half with her, and then she made an introduction to um, Chuck Ryan, who's the CEO of, um, of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Chuck was um, super helpful um, in terms of um, providing some guidance for how to look at Diagnostics. He was very receptive. Again, 90 minutes um, on the phone with him a couple of weeks ago. Um, we'll reconvene uh, in about a month. Um, he needs to process some things, I think. Uh, but yeah, just a, a, a great, um, great resource, and uh, very fortunate to have them in our um, in our court. Um, more work to do to flesh some things out, and I'm working on some leads that he provided me and um, bringing some people um, into the fold to, to support that. Great. Um, Rick, anything you want to speak to on this slide, on this, on this poster? No, because with five minutes left, I, I would like to have a, anyone who wants to introduce themselves on the call, to give them a moment uh, to thank them. Thank you all and weigh in and say hello, uh, I think. Okay. Um, well, we, we've heard from Rick and Stacy. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go to the people that are, uh, that are, that have, if you want to speak, uh, we've heard from Nick as well. Um, if we, if you want to speak, uh, put on your uh, camera. And so I see Leanne, uh, Leanne, maybe you could introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Well, it's an honor to be with you all today. Um, as an oncology nurse of 30 years, I started a company 10 years ago helping cancer patients navigate the healthcare system. And in the event with, with all of the gene genomics, and uh, it has become very, uh, in all cancer diagnoses. I work with some of the physicians and, and scientists on, the, on, the, uh, on today's call. So I'm grateful to be a part of this just to learn, um, also to feed patients to you all. I have two that I'm thinking about, um, but you know the tissue issue. We experience that nationally because uh, we are a national company. Tissue and just the actual testing and getting physicians to test. You are, you two are um, certainly. The, you know there are so many other people that are not less informed, and it's very challenging. And so I'm grateful to have this opportunity to learn from you. Uh, and others on the call, and so we can get more access to people that have, you know, moving forward, uh, the technologies. So thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Um, and you see on our, if you see is, is Beacon you. Associates is, is uh, Leanne's firm. Uh, Jeff Waldron. Uh, Jeff has been uh, on on the journey with a number of these these hackathons and has a lot of experience. Jeff. 
Yeah, I think I know a lot of people on the call. Just, just I'm not a clinical person, but I can uh, make connections sometimes. So that's my forte. And I mentioned uh, in the chat that I've been pretty active and well connected in expanded access programs for new investigational therapies. So um, very often uh, patients with advanced disease, including oncology, aren't considered for clinical trials, as Brad indicated, because they want the drug to succeed. But there's a lot of potential for expanded access programs, including gathering data on patients. So that's one of my areas of focus. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, thanks Rick and Brian. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, Stacy, you, you had a question before, but you really didn't introduce yourself. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind just talking about how you're the super patient. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I'm Stacy Hart. I'm in uh, Pittsburgh, PA. I was treated through UPMC uh, here, and um, I'm happy to help if, if you need anything here in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm a stage four colon cancer survivor. Um, I, I had a really rough battle. I had cancer across 27 places in my body, rectum, liver, lungs, lymph nodes. I had a less than 10% chance of survival. Uh, I was very fortunate. I was an exceptional responder to standard treatment. Um, so I only did full Fox and uh, just as a complete miracle, but um, I, I have a child with a rare disease. So my advocacy stretches across rare disease and oncology. Um, and just, you know, like Jeff, uh, you know, I have a passion for our patient, our fellow patients and uh, blessed to be well connected. And so just here to help and learn and listen and support any way I can. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. Uh, Jason, Jason Sager. Hi, yeah, no, uh, great session. And it's really nice to meet all of you. Um, I, I'm an oncologist, but I'm actually a pediatric oncologist by training. And um, it's really by virtue of seeing how well pediatric oncology did in organizing and getting patients on successive rounds of information gathering, as you've been talking about, as well as then treatment their options. But really, the organization of it really left with a great improvement just over the lifetime of that I've been working in the clinic. Looking at adult oncology, I think they have a lot to gain from that. And I think efforts like this are really um, you know, the, the, the vision of the future in terms of what we hope every patient can access. So my, my hat's off to you guys. I hope that I can, uh, to, can help in some way, shape or form and look forward to, uh, to seeing what comes out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, uh, J Dan, so Bir uh, you, you, we had a quick conversation uh, before we got started, but uh, since we're recording now, if you wouldn't mind, just a quick intro. Yeah, <clears throat> I was diagnosed, um, well, I'm 73, 72 years old. I live in uh, Mercer Island near Seattle. Uh, I was diagnosed in um, 2018, 19, right around that. Yep, and uh, the Gleason 9 prostate cancer, test size of the bones. Um, I had proton uh, radiation in 2019, and it seems to have eradicated. It was mostly for my anal cancer, anal rectal cancer, but it seemed at the same time they beamed into the prostate and they seem to have eradicated the cancer from my prostate gland. So now it's just metastasized into the bones. Um, and uh, so my PSA seems to be under control. I was on Firmagon for a while. And then I went, I took, I went off Firmagon because of side effects and I went on basically an estrogen, estradiol topical cream. And I, I was just on Lupron and I started having heart issues with it. So I've, now I'm back on my process and it's, it's kept my PSA at less than 0 0.01 for a couple of years. I let it rise when I had surgery for my colorectal cancer, but um, um, now it's coming back down and, uh, under control again. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not in that ADT resistant phase yet, but I'm, you know, basically anticipating that could happen at some point. And that's why. Okay. I well, I, I see people dropping off and, and we're sort of at the end of our time. Yep. I just want to say that we will be meeting weekly and okay. uh, we will send out a notice on the subject of each one. And we will also be sending out notes and a recording from this session. 
So we're, we're going to be on a weekly cycle and just hope to see all of you again when you can. And we'll be keeping you informed with notes throughout. Um, uh, if you are, you know, if you have conflicts, as many of you, I'm sure will at this specific time. Thanks. Thanks everybody for joining.